Our first speaker is Dr. Daniel Cameron. Dr. Cameron is the current president of ILADS, that is the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, and a pioneer in Lyme disease as an author of practice guidelines, analytic reviews, and clinical trials. He works in private medical practice in Mount Kisco, New York, and Dr. Cameron is widely recognized for conducting epidemiologic research while practicing medicine. Dr. Cameron. In 1990s, so this is a long time ago, Dr. Steer and Legigian said, well, there's such a thing as neurologic Lyme. Now, neurologic Lyme, you think, well, that should show up on a spinal tap, should show up on an MRI, but it often doesn't. So these symptoms of memory loss, depression, sleep disturbances, difficulty finding words, fatigue, headaches, and irritability, they're things that people experience every day, but the whole package coming together, a change in how you feel, a change in how your kid feels, the severity of the symptoms, the story, is all comes together in a medical office. And, uh, and this is what was really called neurologic Lyme disease. It's not included in a CDC definition, but it's still important. Next. Also in that same neurologic article, there were 10 people out of 27 who had what we call neuropsychiatric manifestations. Neuropsychiatric means that it looks like psychiatric, but it was really from a medical problem. And so they found that in their description that they had symptoms of depression, and three of them sought psychiatric help or received antidepressant medication. Seven had extreme irritability. They became angry over circumstances that previously caused only minor annoyances. Now this is in 1990, before people even knew there were psychiatric issues or uh, neurologic issues. And so it's not like they're afraid of neurologic and psychiatric. This was the first description. But look at 19 years later, they're still debating whether you can have psychiatric issues when it was clearly written in the literature. Also, um, Dr. Fallon, who became a leader as a psychiatrist, and he's at Columbia, he described uh, all types of psychiatric diagnoses that turn out to be Lyme. You know, things like paranoia, dementia, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, panic attacks, major depression, anorexic nervosa, obsessive compulsive. So instead of just accepting the diagnosis, it doesn't hurt to ask questions, get a more of a history, and see whether or not there's an illness underneath it. And so he, since 1992, he continues to be a leader in, in asking doctors to look at psychiatric issues, see whether or not uh, Lyme disease is there. Next. Now, chronic Lyme disease is also a, a hot subject because there's so many people that do poorly that uh, I just wanted to review four different areas where, where not only does chronic Lyme exists, but some of the problems associated with it. Next. Now, now, chronic Lyme can persist for years. So in a Massachusetts group, they found that 34% of people who had been treated what was considered standard therapy were sick three years later. That's quite a few. 62% of those who had been seen in Westchester, and this was a pretty large study, they were six, six years after. And then they started doing trials, you know, Klempner trials and Fallon studies, and they found if they did all kinds of measurements of pain, fatigue, quality of life, that they were sick. So the Klempner people were sick for 4.7 years on average, and Fallon, those people enrolling were sick nine years. So when one says, does it exist, yes, can it be sick for a long time? Yes. Next. Um, can it be severe? Well, if you looked at all the money that went into the NIH trials, they did a lot of formal testing, and they found that all 22 of the tests that were used, they were really sick. So if you looked at just the concept of pain, fatigue, which is like a fatigue severity scale, this short term 36, it's a 36 questions about quality of life, cognition, 
your function in life and some psychopathology like depression and anxiety, they were sick. And so in that article that's published in the um, journal, Fallon wrote, the pain was similar to those of post-surgery patients. And most people know somebody that's come out of surgery, if the pain is of that level, it's got to be a fairly substantial. Fallon wrote that the fatigue was similar to those with multiple sclerosis. And the limitations in physical function were comparable with those with congestive heart failure. Next. The other measure of morbidity is often cost. And so they did a cost study out of a Maryland uh, database and they found that working with this, uh, this population of chronic Lyme, the average annual cost, this is per year, was over $16,000 for each person. Now 5% went to the doctor, but 95% went to indirect costs, non-medical costs, and productivity loss. So when we're talking about you know, these towns, municipalities where, you know, there's always the assumption that the doctors are making all of it. There's so much other things involved if you don't get well and are sick a long time that, you know, if you, you could probably reduce some of the cost of some of the health care in the area by just taking care of Lyme in the first place. Now that study said that it was 203 million if you just look at the CDC numbers, but since there's at least 10 times more cases in any given area, it's got to be at least $2 billion for the cost of chronic Lyme in America with those numbers. Next. And it can be difficult to treat, yes. Uh, part of it's because they've been sick for so long. So the Krupp study, 36% were still sick. Klentner, 60% were still sick, which was horrible numbers. And Fallon, there was significant improvement at six weeks, but then it didn't last, so that was frustrating. Next. Now we want to prevent chronic Lyme. So instead of saying it doesn't exist or it's not a problem, they're not sick, we'd like to do a couple things. Next. First thing we want to do is can we get rid of ticks? That's why we use things like DEET, deer eradication, tick checks. We'd like to, if you actually get bit, get Lyme, you'd like to treat early. You'd like to make everybody uh, have a nice diagnosis, a nice blood test, get timely treatment, prevent ever, ever anybody getting sick. And tertiary is you don't want people being sick nine years, like in the Fallon study. Next. Uh, next. Well, we're, the, we're right in the middle of an old map. This map's about 20 years old. It's already 20 years ago, it was in rough shape. And it's got to be worse now with the cases have gone much higher over the last two decades. You know, the, the numbers climb in all these municipalities. Next. Now, besides the deer, the mice seem to be infected, stay infected all year. Now, a lot of times the, the tick gets a meal from a deer, but sometimes they bite a mouse, get infected, and, and give trouble. But also birds seem to be getting infected and carrying these ticks around. Next the ticks that are around and it was and we already just heard that in just in this area a lot of them contain babesia this was a new jersey study that showed they also contain ehrlichia and also they can contain more th more than one thing this one 43 percent of them had lyme in the in the tick itself